Hey everyone, welcome back to Nintendo Prime. And we have a bunch of news stories for you today. A four pack, I believe. Maybe it's a five pack. I don't know. I already forgot. I've already been researching this for hours. What's going? My mind is out. What is happening? You know what I do know is happening? You see this? We're giving this bad boy away. We're giving one of these away. This is actually mine. No, mine, not yours. Mine. You can have one yourself. Now, the big thing about this giveaway is that you need to go down into the pinned comment or the description to enter, and there's actually additional giveaways you can get every single day of this month. There will be a hidden code. In fact, I forgot yesterday's hidden code, so there's the code for yesterday. But don't worry, stay tuned till sometime randomly later in this video. There will be another code for today, and every day you can get 20 additional entries. So, you know, checking out our daily videos is probably a good idea if you care to win. Although, you know why you should really be watching? Because we got some amazing news coming straight to you. Editor, roll it. So our first story deals with Square Enix. So here's the thing. Square Enix is actually looking to do something very, very interesting. They had their earnings investors call last night, and we learned a couple weird things about something happening at the company. And I say weird, I just mean different compared to how other companies handle their business. So Square Enix Financials, like every other major company, were down year over year and down to over the last two years. Every company's reporting that coming out of the pandemic that, hey, you know what? People aren't buying and playing games as much as they were when they were stuck at home. Who knew? But Square Enix has a solution to one of their financial issues, and that is that they want to lower their risk management when investing in games with their studios because games cost more than ever to make. So to lower that risk, they actually want to take on investors. And I'm not talking about people buying shares in their company. No, no, no. We're talking about people buying shares in the individual studios themselves. That's right. They want to give up partial ownership of their individual studios to increase capital efficiency. Now, for those who don't understand what capital efficiency means, essentially if you invest a dollar in a game and then the game releases and you make a dollar, you have a one-to-one -one capital efficiency. Basically, you made no money, but you didn't lose any money. You broke even. Well, they don't want to break even. Companies want to make money. So to increase that capital efficiency, they want to lower their individual risk by letting studios come in, letting companies come in and invest in their game development studios and take part of that ownership. So yes, Square Enix would no longer fully own certain development studios, although they're likely to maintain their majority stake. So this lowers their risk and gets more companies involved. So that dollar you spent is split so many ways and then obviously if there's a profit then you know you end up you know everyone wins if there is only breaking even well you didn't waste so much money in that investment anyways because it lowered your risk okay so that is essentially what Square Enix is looking to do and we've heard rumors about Sony in the past and now look we got all this information from David Gibson which is important to know because he was in on the earnings call so I want to make sure the source is properly talked about here link to all this down in the description because there's a whole lot of interesting details from this financial report if you really want to dive deep but what I actually am curious about is who's going to invest and according to David Gibson Sony Tencent and Nexon seem to be the likely candidates to invest now no shocker, Tencent invests in everything. Uh, and Sony has been rumored to be going in on stuff. They obviously pay a lot of money to get Final Fantasy exclusively on PlayStation 5, at least for a set time period. So I think, though, Nintendo is someone that we need to pay attention to. And while David Gibson doesn't mention Nintendo, it's notable for a few things. One, Nintendo does get some console-exclusive games from Square Enix. We're talking Bravely Default, Bravely Default 2, Octopet Traveler, although that eventually went multi-console, Triangle Strategy as well. Oh, and by the way, Nintendo already owns 92,000 shares in Square Enix. And I know that sounds like a lot. It's actually not that many, but they do own some shares in Square Enix. So Nintendo's already invested in Square Enix as it is. So it wouldn't be, I think, too crazy to see them go into the development studios behind Bravely Default, behind Triangle Strategy, and actually want to get some ownership over those studios and the benefit to them, just like the benefit to Sony would be, you could basically guarantee console exclusivity of those studios while Square Enix still maintains primary ownership. So yeah, Square Enix is kind of divvying themselves up. Now we heard of the rumors about Sony outright buying Square Enix. Clearly Square Enix is like, mm, 
we don't know if we want to be outright purchased, but we are willing to sell stakes in individual studios. Uh, and maybe that leads to them eventually selling off individual studios <laughs> like they did to Embracer Group. They sold off pretty much all their Western studios to Embracer Group. Hey, Embracer Group, congratulations on now owning Tomb Raider and Hitman 3 and all the rest. You guys are, you guys got some top tier IPs. Please do right by them. But yeah, we'll see what happens with this. This is obviously a new idea for them. Other studios have dabbled in similar things like this before, but not studios to this pedigree. Capcom likes to maintain ownership of their studios. Nintendo maintains ownership of their studios. Ubisoft maintains ownership of their studios. It's very strange to give up partial ownership, but Square Enix is also beating to the beat of their own drum, and they've seen success over the recent years, so let's just see what happens. This could end up being a really good thing. It could also lead to companies fighting over divvying up studios and Square Enix just being like, whatever, as long as you guys are paying us, we're good. So we just talked about companies trying to invest and take over some of Square Studios. What if I were to told you Tencent ain't done? Because while Tencent might be involved there, Tencent is attempting to purchase a bunch of shares in Ubisoft. In fact, they are looking to get a majority stake in the company. Now, they already you know, own some shares in Ubisoft, but they're actually making a deal behind the scenes, so it seems, so it's being reported, with the Guillemot family. Now, Yves Guillemot is the current CEO and president of Ubisoft, but his family is actually the major stakeholder. They own more shares in Ubisoft than any other individual shareholder. And the Guillemot family owns about 15% of Ubisoft. The other 85% or so is divvied up uh, between a whole bunch of public you know, selling and stuff. And that family is actually considering selling a significant chunk of that 15% to Tencent. So we know that in the past, Ubisoft successfully warded off a hostile takeover. Vivendi was trying to actually get 51% of Ubisoft so they could get full control of the company. And you know, Yves Guillemot and you know, his family didn't want that to happen. They talked to some of the bigger shareholders and kind of got everyone together to be like, we refuse to sell to Vivendi, preventing Vivendi's hostile takeover. Vivendi then went on to just sell all of their shares. So Tencent already owns a little bit of shares in Ubisoft. They're looking to get a high percentage from the Gima family. And by the way, Tencent's also looking to get a huge chunk of the public shares. Now, we don't know if they're trying to get to 15, 20, 25. 40, or are they attempting to get to 51%? We do know that Tencent is stating that Ubisoft is a key partner for them, but it does appear, especially with the, the Gima family willing to give up some of their shares, that this could end up being a sort of a hostile takeover, a friendly takeover. And I know that scares some people because a lot of people do not like Tencent. So for our third story today, we actually have some really great news for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. So we have some launch figures that are showing that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is actually setting a new standard for both Monolith Soft and the Xenoblade franchise, breaking franchise record launch sales. Now we don't have sales data for every territory. We only have Japan and a little bit of information on the UK, but the information from the UK is pretty important. So let's first jump into the Famitsu sales charts where Xenoblade Chronicles 3 actually debuted at number one. It sold 112,728 units, which is notably a higher figure than Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition and Xenoblade Chronicles did in the charts in Japan. So just physical sales alone, they're already the best-selling Xenoblade Chronicle game at launch. However, we need to consider a lot more things. There are a lot of things at play here that maybe you're not considering. One thing in particular is that the split in terms of sales in Japan is about 50-50 in terms of digital and physical, and digital sales are not included in this chart. Also, because you had to go through Nintendo for this, sales of the special edition, which sold out in Japan, are also not counted because Nintendo doesn't provide any sales data directly from their store. So in the end, it's highly likely that the debut sales in Japan were very, very close, if not exceeding 200,000 sales. Now we don't know that for sure, but you count the digital in, you count the special edition in, you obviously have the exact data for physical, and you can paint a pretty good picture that it sold about 200,000 units in Japan. This also ended up boosting Nintendo Switch sales over 70,000, which it hadn't been over in a few weeks. So that's obviously really good news showing that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 actually has a little bit of system sale power, at least in Japan. Now, I mentioned that it also sold really, really well in the UK. Well, that's because it actually debuted at number one on the UK charts, which is always huge for a niche franchise like this. But what's also huge about this is, <coughs> hey, 
Did you know that it's now the best-selling Xenoblade Chronicles game at launch ever? In the UK! That's right, it topped Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which was the prior top-selling game in the UK at launch. Obviously, we don't know if this is going to end up being the best-selling Xenoblade game overall. You know, we're going to need a long tail of sales before we actually get the full picture on that. But I fully suspect by the end of this year, by the end of this fiscal year at least for Nintendo, the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is highly likely to be the best-selling Xenoblade game ever. And this looks like a tentpole title. Congratulations on the early success. I know I'm having a really good time with Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Maybe you're having a really good time too. And if you're not, but you've always wanted to try a JRPG, maybe this is the one to try out. Our final story actually deals with that new wave of DLC for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. You guys remember the Wave 2 DLC? Well, it looks like it's been data mined. What a surprise. Data miners are always uh, doing their thing and finding any little minute details left in the code base. And it turns out that the Wave 2 DLC actually had some stuff left in that essentially confirms possibly 14 upcoming tracks in the DLC pack. So not all of the remaining tracks, but quite a few of them. And this is because the data mine actually discovered that music preview files were left in this DLC. Let's actually go to Nintendo Life's summary on this and you know, get into what was actually leaked. So what is a music preview file? Because it may take some time to load a full music file from the ROM, a separate prefetch file is created of the first. It's about a second, which can be loaded into memory in advance. This prefetch is played while the full file is being loaded. Unfortunately for Nintendo, while they deleted the full songs of unreleased courses from the ROM, they accidentally left some of the prefetch files, and they sorted them in a separate place. It's possible to identify several courses just based off that one second of music. Now, this ended up coming from famed data miner Oatmeal Dome. So Oatmeal Dome is well known to actually be a really, really legit data miner, but it's actually somebody else who then took this data and was able to interpret it into what the 14 tracks are. So let's actually get into what those tracks are and then who provided this information. So, hey, let's look at the 14 tracks. So in the Rock Cup that's gonna be added, we have London Loop, which is from Mario Kart Tour, Peach Gardens, which is from the DS game, Boo Lake and Broken Pier from Game Boy Advance, and Alpine Pass from the 3DS. In the Moon Cup, we have the Berlin Byways from Mario Kart Tour, Waluigi Stadium and Wario Coliseum, so you know, different names of it, from the GameCube. We have Merry Mountains from whatever, don't know, could be a brand new track, and Rainbow Road from the 3DS. Next up in the Fruit Cup, we have Amsterdam Drift from Tour, maybe we in DS? There's a... The, 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 this little second of music is just really similar to some other tracks as well. Boomerang Cup, we have Singapore Speedway from Tour, GameCube, GBA. And we have Los Angeles Laps from Tour. We have Feather Cup uh, in front. We have Tour, We and Sunset Wilds. So a whole bunch of stuff in there. We'll put up some charts here to make this a little less confusing for you guys. Cherry Cup, we have uh, Bangkok Rush from Tour. And that's also in GameCube and Super Nintendo, possibly. Acorn Cup is Vancouver Velocity from Tour and Maple Trio from Wii. Maybe some other things. Again, these are one second clips, so the exact deciphering can be really, really hard. And Spiny Cup Tour, GameCube, Wii, etc. You know, we don't actually know everything. We, we do have an idea of what games will have tracks, but we don't necessarily know anything else. Now, so all this track information actually came from Fish Guy 6564. Now, I'm sure Nintendo is. Probably not happy to have this stuff get data binded out there. Uh, Nintendo did, you know, go through the foresight to delete all of the actual full music tracks, which would have really gave us all the confirmation we needed, but not getting rid of the prefetch. You know, kind of an oversight. Uh, Nintendo and many companies have leaks coming through data mines all the time, so I don't know how much Nintendo is actually embarrassed by this, but I will just say this. I'm excited by these tracks. Some of these tracks are among my favorites. Now, again, it's not the entire track list, and some things that we have leaks for are literally just, hey, what game it's gonna be. Is it gonna be a Super Nintendo game? It's gonna be a GameCube one. It's gonna be from Tour, but we don't actually know what they are. So we don't know everything. That's important to note. This leak doesn't give us the rest of the tracks, but it does give us 14 of them, and I think that's kind of interesting. So why don't you guys let me know what you think about this down in the comments below. I am Nathaniel Ruffle Jans from Nintendo Prime, and I wanna thank you so much for being here, and I'll catch you in the next video.